The Ghost Pirates by William Hope Hodgson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ghost Pirates. Chapter 8. After the coming of the mist, things seemed to develop pretty quickly. In the following two or three days, a good deal happened. On the night of the day on which the skipper had sent me away from the wheel, it was our watch on deck from eight o'clock to twelve, and my lookout from ten to twelve. As I paced slowly to and fro across the forecastle head, I was thinking about the affair of the morning. At first, my thoughts were about the old man. I cursed him thoroughly to myself for being a pig-headed old fool, until it occurred to me that if I had been in his place and come on deck to find the ship almost aback and the fellow at the wheel staring out across the sea instead of attending to his business, I should most certainly have kicked up a thundering row. And then I had been an ass to tell him about the ship. I should never have done such a thing if I had not been a bit adrift. Most likely the old chap thought I was cracked. I ceased to bother my head about him and fell to wondering why the second mate had looked at me so queerly in the morning. Did he guess more of the truth than I supposed? And if that were the case, why had he refused to listen to me? After that I went to puzzling about the mist. I had thought a great deal about it during the day. One idea appealed to me very strongly. It was that the actual visible mist was a materialized expression of an extraordinarily subtle atmosphere in which we were moving. Abruptly, as I walked backwards and forwards, taking occasional glances over the sea, which was almost calm, my eye caught the glow of a light out in the darkness. I stood still and stared. I wondered whether it was the light of a vessel. In that case, we were no longer enveloped in that extraordinary atmosphere. I bent forward and gave the thing my more immediate attention. I saw then that it was undoubtedly the green light of a vessel on our port bow. It was plain that she was bent on crossing our bows. What was more, she was dangerously near. The size and brightness of her light showed that. She would be close-hauled while we were going free so that of course it was our place to get out of her way. Instantly, I turned and, putting my hands up to my mouth, hailed the second mate. Light on the port bow, sir. The next moment his hail came back. Whereabouts? He must be blind, I said to myself. About two points on the bow, sir, I sung out. Then I turned to see whether she had shifted her position at all. Yet when I came to look, there was no light visible. I ran forward to the bows and leant over the rail and stared, but there was nothing, absolutely nothing except the darkness all about us. For perhaps a few seconds I stood thus, and a suspicion swept across me that the whole business was practically a repetition of the affair of the morning. Evidently the impalpable something that invested the ship had thinned for an instant, thus allowing me to see the light ahead. Now it had closed again. Yet, whether I could see or not, I did not doubt the fact that there was a vessel ahead and very close ahead too. We might run on top of her any minute. My only hope was that, seeing we were not getting out of her way, she had put her helm up so as to let us pass with the intention of then crossing under our stern. I waited pretty anxiously, watching and listening. Then, all at once, I heard steps coming along the deck forward, and the Prentice, whose timekeeping it was, came up on the forecastle head. The second mate says he can't see any light, Jessop, he said, coming over to where I stood. Whereabouts is it? I don't know, I answered. I've lost sight of it myself. It was a green light, about a couple of points on the port bow. It seemed fairly close. Perhaps their lamp's gone out he suggested, after peering out pretty hard into the night for a minute or so. Perhaps, I said. I did not tell him that the light had been so close that, even in the darkness, we should now have been able to see the ship herself. 
You're quite sure it was a light and not a star? He asked doubtfully after another long stare. Oh, no, I said. It may have been the moon, now I come to think about it. Don't rot, he replied. It's easy enough to make a mistake. What shall I say to the second mate? Tell him it's disappeared, of course. Where to? he asked. How the devil should I know? I told him. Don't ask silly questions. All right, keep your rag in, he said and went aft to report to the second mate. Five minutes later, it might have been, I saw the light again. It was broad on the bow and told me plainly enough that she had up with her helm to escape being run down. I did not wait a moment, but sung out to the second mate that there was a green light about four points on the port bow. By Jove, it must have been a close shave. The light did not seem to be more than a hundred yards away. It was fortunate that we had not much way through the water. Now, I thought to myself, the second will see the thing, and perhaps Mr. Blooming Prentice will be able to give the star its proper name. Even as the thought came into my head, the light faded and vanished, and I caught the second mate's voice. Where away? he was singing out. It's gone again, sir, I answered. A minute later, I heard him coming along the deck. He reached the foot of the starboard ladder. Where are you, Jessop? he inquired. Here, sir, I said, and went to the top of the weather ladder. He came up slowly onto the forecastle head. What's this you've been singing out about a light? he asked. Just point out exactly where it was you last saw it. This I did, and he went over to the port rail and stared away into the night, but without seeing anything. It's gone, sir, I ventured to remind him, though I've seen it twice now, once about a couple of points on the bow, and this last time brought away on the bow, but it disappeared both times almost at once. I don't understand it at all, Jessop, he said in a puzzled voice. Are you sure it was a ship's light? Yes, sir, a green light. It was quite close. I don't understand, he said again. Run aft and ask the prentice to pass you down my night glasses. Be as smart as you can. Aye, aye, sir, I replied and ran aft. In less than a minute, I was back with his binoculars, and with them he stared for some time at the sea to leeward. All at once, he dropped them to his side and faced round on me with a sudden question. Where's she gone to? If she shifted her bearing as quickly as all that, she must be precious close. We should be able to see her spars and sails, or her cabin light, or her binnacle light or something. It's queer, sir, I assented. Damned queer, he said. So damned queer that I'm inclined to think you've made a mistake. No, sir. I'm certain it was a light. Where's the ship, then? he asked. I can't say, sir. That's just what's been puzzling me. The second said nothing in reply, but took a couple of quick turns across the forecastle head, stopping at the port rail and taking another look to leeward through his night glasses. Perhaps a minute he stood there. Then, without a word, he went down the lee ladder and away aft along the main deck to the poop. He's jolly well puzzled, I thought to myself, or else he thinks I've been imagining things. Either way, I guessed he'd think that. In a little, I began to wonder whether, after all, he had any idea of what might be the truth. One minute, I would feel certain he had, and the next, I was just as sure that he guessed nothing. I got one of my fits of asking myself whether it would not have been better to have told him everything. It seemed to me that he must have seen sufficient to make him inclined to listen to me. And yet, I could not by any means be certain. I might only have been making an ass of myself in his eyes, or set him thinking I was dotty. I was walking about the forecastle head, feeling like this, when I saw the light for the third time. It was very bright and big, and I could see it move, as I watched. This again showed me that it must be very close. Surely, I thought, the second mate must see it now for himself. 
I did not sing out this time right away. I thought I would let the second see for himself that I had not been mistaken. Besides, I was not going to risk its vanishing again the instant I had spoken. For quite half a minute I watched it, and there was no sign of its disappearing. Every moment I expected to hear the second mate's hail, showing that he had spotted it at last. But none came. I could stand it no longer, and I ran to the rail on the after part of the forecastle head. Green light a little abaft the beam, sir, I hung out at the top of my voice. But I had waited too long. Even as I shouted, the light blurred and vanished. I stamped my foot and swore. The thing was making a fool of me. Yet I had a faint hope that those aft had seen it just before it disappeared. But this I knew was vain. Directly I heard the second's voice. Light be damned, he shouted. Then he blew his whistle, and one of the men ran aft, out of the forecastle, to see what it was he wanted. Whose next lookout is it? I heard him ask. Jasket, sir. Then tell Jasket to relieve Jessup at once. Do you hear? Yes, sir, said the man, and came forward. In a minute, Jasket stumbled up onto the forecastle head. What's up, mate? he asked sleepily. It's that fool of a second mate, I said savagely. I've reported a light to him three times, and because the blind fool can't see it, he sent you up to relieve me. Where is it, mate? he inquired. He looked round at the dark sea. I don't see no light, he remarked after a few moments. No, I said, it's gone. Eh? he inquired. It's gone. I repeated irritably. He turned and regarded me silently through the dark. I'd go and have a sleep, mate, he said at length. I've been that way myself. There's nothing like a snooze when your gets like that. What? I said. Like what? It's all right, mate. You'll be all right in the morning. Don't you worry about me. His tone was sympathetic. Hell, was all I said and walked down off the forecastle head. I wondered whether the old fellow thought I was going silly. Have a sleep by Jove, I muttered to myself. I wonder who'd feel like having a sleep after what I've seen and stood today. I felt rotten, with no one understanding what was really the matter. I seemed to be all alone, through the things I had learnt. Then the thought came to me to go aft and talk the matter over with Tammy. I knew he would be able to understand, of course, and it would be such a relief. On the impulse, I turned and went aft, along the deck to the Prentice's berth. As I neared the break of the poop, I looked up and saw the dark shape of the second mate leaning over the rail above me. "'Who's that?' he asked. "'It's Jessup, sir,' I said. "'What do you want in this part of the ship?' he inquired. "'I'd come aft to speak to Tammy, sir,' I replied. You go along forward and turn in, he said, not altogether unkindly. A sleep will do you more good than yarning about. You know, you're getting to fancy things too much. I'm sure I'm not, sir. I'm perfectly well. I... That will do, he interrupted sharply. You go and have a sleep. I gave a short curse under my breath and went slowly forward. I was getting maddened with being treated as if I were not quite sane. By God, I said to myself, wait till the fools know what I know. Just wait. I entered the forecastle through the port doorway and went across to my chest and sat down. I felt angry and tired and miserable. Coyne and Plummer were sitting close by, playing cards and smoking. Stubbins lay in his bunk watching them and also smoking. As I sat down, he put his head forward over the bunk board and regarded me in a curious, meditative way. "'What's up with their second officer?' he asked after a short stare. I looked at him, and the other two men looked up at me. I felt I should go off with a bang, if I did not say something, and let out pretty stiffly, telling them the whole business. Yet I had seen enough to know that it was no good trying to explain things, so I just told them the plain, bold facts and left explanations as much alone as possible. 
Three times, you say? said Stubbins when I had finished. Yes, I assented. And their old men sent you from the wheel this morning because you're happened to see a ship he couldn't, Plummer added in a reflective tone. Yes, I said again. I thought I saw him look at Coyne significantly, but Stubbins, I noticed, looked only at me. I reckon their second thinks you're a bit off color, he remarked after a short pause. The second mate's a fool, I said with some bitterness. A confounded fool! I ain't so sure about that, he replied. It's bound to seem queer to him. I don't understand it myself. He lapsed into silence and smoked. I can't understand how it is their second mate didn't happen to spot it, Coyne said in a puzzled voice. It seemed to me that Plummer nudged him to be quiet. It looked as if Plummer shared the second mate's opinion, and the idea made me savage. But Stubbins's next remark drew my attention. I don't understand it, he said again, speaking with deliberation. All they're saying, their second should have savvied enough not to have slung you off their lookout. He nodded his head slowly, keeping his gaze fixed on my face. How do you mean? I asked, puzzled yet with a vague sense that the man understood more, perhaps, than I had hitherto thought. I mean, what's their second so blessed cocksure about? He took a draw at his pipe, removed it, and leant forward somewhat over his bunk board. Didn't he say nothing to you after you came off the lookout? he asked. Yes, I replied. He spotted me going aft. He told me I was getting to imagining things too much. He said I'd better come forward and get a sleep. And what did you say? Nothing. I came forward. Why didn't you bloom and well harsk him if he weren't doing their imagining trick when he sent us chasing up their main after that boogeyman of his? I never thought of it, I told him. Well, you ought to have. He paused and sat up in his bunk and asked for a match. As I passed in my box, Coyne looked up from his game. It might have been a stowaway, you know. You can't say it's ever been proved as it wasn't. Stubbins passed the box back to me and went on without noticing Coyne's remark. Told you to go and have a snooze, did he? I don't understand what he's bluffing at. How do you mean, bluffing? I asked. He nodded his head sagely. It's my idea. He knows you saw that light, just as blue and well as I do. Plummer looked up from his game at this speech, but said nothing. Then you don't doubt that I really saw it? I asked with a certain surprise. Not me, he remarked with assurance. You ain't likely to make that kind of mistake three times running. No, I said. I know I saw the light right enough, but... I hesitated a moment. It's blessed queer. It is blessed queer he agreed. It's damned queer. And there's a lot of other damn queer things happening aboard this packet lately. He was silent for a few seconds. Then he spoke suddenly. It's not natural. I'm damn sure of that much. He took a couple of draws at his pipe, and in the momentary silence I caught Jaskett's voice above us. He was hailing the poop. Red light on the starboard quarter, sir! I heard him sing out. There you are, I said with a jerk of my head. That's about where that packet I spotted ought to be by now. She couldn't cross our bows, so she uphelm and let us pass, and now she's hauled up again and gone under our stern. I got up from the chest and went to the door, the other three following. As we stepped out on deck, I heard the second mate shouting out away aft to know the whereabouts of the light. By Jove, Stubbins, I said. I believe the blessed thing's gone again. We ran to the starboard side in a body and looked over, but there was no sign of a light in the darkness astern. I can't say as I see any light, said Coyne. Plummer said nothing. I looked up at the forecastle head. There I could faintly distinguish the outlines of Jasket. He was standing by the starboard rail with his hands up, shading his eyes, evidently staring towards the place where he had last seen the light. 
Where's she got to, Jaskett? I called out. I can't say, mate, he answered. It's the most ellishly funny thing I've ever come to cross. She were there as plain as me at one minute, and the next she were gone, clean gone. I turned to Plummer. What do you think about it now? I asked him. Well, he said, I'll admit, I thought at first were something and nothing. I thought you was mistaken, but it seems you did see something. Away aft, we heard the sound of steps along the deck. The second's coming forward for a explanation, Jasket, Stubbins sung out. You better go down and change your breeks. The second mate passed us and went up the starboard ladder. What's up now, Jasket? he said quickly. Where is this light? Neither the Prentice nor I can see it. The damn thing's clean gone, sir, Jasket replied. Gone, the second mate said. Gone. What do you mean? She were there one minute, sir, as plain as me at, and their next, she's gone. That's a damn silly yarn to tell me, the second replied. You don't expect me to believe it, do you? It's gospel truth anyhow, sir, Jasket answered, and Jessup seen it just the same. He seemed to have added that last part as an afterthought. Evidently, the old beggar had changed his opinion as to my need for sleep. You're an old fool, Jasket the second said sharply, and that idiot Jessup has been putting things into your silly old head. He paused an instant. Then he continued, What the devil's the matter with you all that you've taken to this sort of game? You know very well that you saw no light. I sent Jessup off the lookout, and then you must go and start the same game. We haven't, Jasket started to say, but the second silenced him. Stow it, he said and turned and went down the ladder, passing us quickly without a word. Doesn't look to me, Stubbins, I said, as though the second did believe we've seen the light. I ain't so sure, he answered. He's a puzzler. The rest of the watch passed away quietly, and at eight bells I made haste to turn in, for I was tremendously tired. When we were called again for the four to eight watch on deck, I learnt that one of the men in the mate's watch had seen a light soon after we had gone below and had reported it, only for it to disappear immediately. This, I found, had happened twice, and the mate had got so wild, being under the impression that the man was playing the fool, that he had nearly come to blows with him, finally ordering him off the lookout and sending another man up in his place. If this last man saw the light, He took good care not to let the mate know, so that the matter had ended there. And then, on the following night, before we had ceased to talk about the matter of the vanishing lights, something else occurred that temporarily drove from my mind all memory of the mist, and the extraordinary, blind atmosphere it seemed to usher. End of chapter 8